lesson about the biblical exegesis number two. So again, to remind you, we are tackling the topic the subject of Biblical Exegesis 2, which deals with, <coughs> excuse me, deals with the question of how do we do this Biblical Exegesis? And as we try to, you know, do exegesis, I told you that this exegesis is basically a science. Science of having a good uh, rational systematic knowledge at the body of knowledge. And the, the, the process that comes with finding and verifying that knowledge, whether it's given or you're doing a new findings. So you must be a good student of science. And again, you need to be a good researcher. So last class, we talked about what does this research involve? How do you know if something that we do is a research? So one, you identify problem, two, uh, and uh, you have to have a certain rational the reason for the given research and it needs to be approved by your community of uh, the researchers and number three you need to specify your goal or objectives for the given research and then number four you may have assumption or a theory it's not a must but you usually, uh, you may have a certain assumption or a theory. And we'll continue. How, what, what is the research and how do you do it? Then you need to have a, a good research plan before you actually tackle the given research. So where you start, how you're going to process that research, and how you're going to uh, close. And it's kind of a timeline. And by stating the research plan, you know what is involved, meaning how much time that you need to put into. What are some, some uh, the things the, the, that are required. Thus, you know how much money it is going to take to do the, the given research. And uh, sometimes when it's a, it's a group project, you need to know who's going to involve, how many people are going to be involved. So that kind of sets the tone for your research. And uh, I mean, that's not a, you know, uh, usually required when you do the uh, biblical exegesis. But other researches, any other good scientific researches, they demand a good, detailed research plan. Without a research plan, you don't know where you are going and what you're doing, and you keep changing the plans. And when that happens, it takes more energy, a lot of more money, which usually is a waste. And uh, number six, uh, you do need a, a methodology. Uh, there are many different methods of research, and uh, probably hundreds of different uh, methods when you're trying to tackle a, a certain problem. And then this, this kind of question and problem requires this kind of methodology and that, if that kind of question, if question is different, then you don't need a different methodology. But in the, 
even even with the uh, the duplicate exegesis, there are several different methods of doing the study. Then seven, number seven is research proper. That's uh, actually you are doing the search and the research of the resources and of all the documents and all the uh, possible uh, uh, things that you can do as a researcher. Then number eight, finally you come with findings. After all doing all these works, putting a lot of energy and time and a lot of efforts, you come up with findings. So that's that's the uh, the, the uh, you know uh, the thing that you kind of get up. It's like a you know uh, gold mining. You when if you're trying to get the gold, you have to you know find where gold might be. Do the research for that, and then you dig a tunnel and dig out the the stones that may have. Uh, this uh, gold uh, in it, and then break it, then melt it, and then and then refine it, and then then come up with a piece of gold. Same thing with the research. It takes a, a, a quite amount of energy and the time and the money. But biblical exegesis, you don't need the money, but uh, it takes a lot of time and uh, energy as well. Then once you have the findings, then implication. Uh, this is very important for the biblical exegesis. What this finding, these findings have meaning to me? Is it significant for me, my life, my community? Is what God is saying? Does, does, does that have any uh, good effect or does that imply to me? Is it saying, what, what is it saying to me? So that's kind of implication. Number 10, further study or related study. Any good uh, scientific research would not end as you have those findings. When you answer the certain questions and then when you resolve certain problems, it adds, add plus, add more problems and more questions. That's a good research. So it continues and it opens the door to the next problem, next set of issues, next set of questions. And then you have to continue to do the research. Same thing with the biblical exegesis. When you eventually find the answers to your question, then as you go through this uh, investigation, there pops up, pops up other questions. And now you, are, you have more questions and problems than as you started. That's the way it should be. So it's a good thing when you find the uh, uh, other questions and problems and then you continue to tackle those things. See? So that's the end of the subject on the uh, exegesis as a research and uh, now we'll continue with the the chapter two So, we know this exegesis, biblical exegesis, is a kind of science and it requires uh, 
certain level of research and it is our research so you need to mind to have a mind of researcher a mind of scientist see not the artist so good theology good theology it is a, a good science again I say that again a good theology is a good science and this science, this particular science called exegesis, it involves a very, very big contents, big portion of interpretation. So, one to do better in this particular science called exegesis you need to be a good interpreter. Interpreter. Uh, so you know you need to know and you need to understand what the interpretation is and how how you do the interpretation. So mainly this particular class uh, will deal with the the science of doing interpretation because major proportion of uh, this exegesis, biblical exegesis, the majority of the, the, the process is, has to do with the term interpretation. So chapter 2 deals with uh, this concept of interpretation and you need to understand what the interpretation is about. Uh, it is not new thing for any of you because every human being with a good mind and maturity even not maturity even babies do this uh, that the people begin their life by interpreting the word around himself or herself and then the words that you hear, you keep interpreting those words that you listen and hear. As you use, uh, see the news on the TV, you're not just listening. If you're a good uh, listener, then you are interpreting the, 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 the news message. So, the life involves interpretation even as you drive on the street you keep interpreting how those signs on the street and the words the directions all these things that's kind of interpretation interpretation means perceiving Perceiving your reality or the message in your own way. So no person has the exact same interpretation because every individual is different. So a person A may have a interpretation, person B would have interpretation B even though they are looking at the same word same passage because everyone is different so that's kind of interpretation perception your own perception of the reality actually is the interpretation so that's the general concept of in interpretation what the interpretation generally is and uh, we are going into the biblical interpretation or interpretation of the Bible. First, you gotta know the Bible by nature because it's a, a scripture and it is holy scripture and it is uh, given from God who is beyond our understanding, beyond our ability. 
is much bigger than who we are. He is unlimited while we are limited. Because of that, uh, you know, uh, the author of Bible is unique. God is unique. He is very different from us. And the Bible, the Word of God, is also unique. So you got to understand that the, the material that you're reading is not the, the human uh, writing. It's, even though it's written by human beings, the source, uh, the given, is not a human being. It's someone who is beyond us. And uh, you need to understand that nature. And uh, that nature is, is, is uh, embedded in the in his message embedded means is, is within uh, so bible is unique how how unique is it uh, number one it's mysterious it's difficult to understand because we are limited while he is much bigger the way he sees is different from the way we see the thing the, 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 uh, you know, he's beyond our understanding. Thus, the words he says to us are be many times beyond understanding. But the thing is, God is good God. He did not intend, intended us to be confused. It's not the intention of the Bible. Though it, it is mysterious, it does not mean that you, you are not going to be able to understand the message. Mysterious means you need to take an extra step than while, while as you are dealing with a human being. Human beings are mysterious as well, but they are not as mysterious as God is. It takes a little more effort and a very careful calculation and Get very careful understanding of God Himself to be able to understand His message. Not only is uh, mysterious the biblical messages, the, the uh, biblical contents that we are going to deal with as we try to do the good biblical exegesis, many, many times the verses that we see the contents that we read are ambiguous. Ambiguous means, uh, if you look at the dictionary, it means double or triple meaning. So even if it's the same word or same phrase even, or same sentence, it could mean several different things depending on the context, context of the writing. So we are not only reading the text that is given, given text, but we are also reading the context to clarify, clarify this ambiguity. Ambiguity is always present because the words people say, even as we communicate, many times it could be ambiguous. So many, many expressions have double or triple meaning. Same thing with the Word of God. Uh, that the Bible, many passages are ambiguous. It could mean two things. It could be, it could mean one of the two things, or it could mean both. So uh, that that's very unique uh, characteristic of the Bible. And the, the thing is, sometimes, sometimes this ambiguity is, is intended. And uh, I'll, later on, I, I mean, many of the Jesus' parable, the, the saying of Jesus, the story of Jesus that were uh, given to the, to the disciples, they are intended to be ambiguous. And uh, even he says, 
those who has ears to to hear then they hear those who does not have those ears to hear then they uh, i don't care if they are able to understand or not so that's intended ambiguity literal verse literary uh, we are not trying to do literal interpretation Literal means you do not go beyond what it is saying in letter and the writing. So what it is written is what, what it means. For example, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say unto you, or I say to you, truly, truly, I say to you. If you take it literal, okay. Jesus is saying a true statement. But when you go literary understanding of that same message, truly, truly, I say unto you, it means I'm going to emphasize this particular message that I am teaching you or telling you. So that's the meaning of truly truly when it is repeated when truly is two times repeated by i mean it is a jewish culture at the time and the the and the the, the oral tradition and the written tradition same thing when verily verily or truly truly are repeated it means this is a very important and so thus you're gonna uh, listen carefully so truly truly i say unto you means listen very carefully this is important so that's the literary interpretation but literal interpretation with a limit okay jesus is saying something that is truthful okay. bible is unique and fact that there are certain gaps that we need to cross. We need to uh, lay the bridge on. And uh, much of the effort that when we do, someone does a, a biblical exegesis is put into trying to fill these gaps. There is a gap of time, first of all, the most recent uh, documents that we find in the New Testament was written 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago. So there is a that gap of time and history. And that there is a gap of language, and there is a gap of culture, and there is a gap of uh, the, the, the style and so on so we are to cross the or bridge those gaps when we are trying to understand the Bible. if something is written within your own culture within like a, a day or two there's no need for to fill these gaps but the, the Bible for anyone whether you're American, even for the Greeks, as they read the, the, the Greek New Testament, that language is different. It's not the same as a modern Greek. So there certainly exist these gaps that you need to bridge. And then, human ego and prejudice. Because it is an interpretation, I told you that it is very subjective and it's personal. One individual to the other individual, there cannot be the same exact uh, interpretation of the given text. 
not only is a very individual. Uh, by nature, when you are trying to interpret uh, Bible or any other document for that matter, people become very egoistic, selfish, and people do have certain prejudice. I mean, no one is without prejudice, whether it's a racial, whether it's religion, or whether it's a, about the economic status, or it's about uh, the, the, the outlook and the style or dress someone uh, wear. See, even food, food is something that uh, most of people have certain prejudice. Not just the preference. A preference is uh, what you favor, and there, there's nothing wrong uh, having a preference. It's, it's your style, it's your taste, and that's allowed. Uh, I mean, it's okay uh, culturally and ethically and politically to, to have a certain preference. Uh, it is okay. It's a, it's a matter of having diversity, and we have that freedom to have preference. But prejudice is saying, I like this, and he or she like that, and that is wrong. That is not right. That is lower than me. See, once you say that, and even if, even if you don't say that, if you have that feeling, that kind of attitude inside you, and you are prejudiced. And this, these things, the prejudice take a, may take a big part in doing your interpretation without knowing, without knowing you are actually doing and uh, taking these steps toward the prejudice. You twist the message and then the, the more than prejudice the, the, that matters uh, doing biblical interpretation, biblical exegesis, is your own ego. Human, by nature, without, without you knowing it, are very selfish, self-centered. If, if not self, selfish, we are self-centered. So we, I can safely say any, any people that, you know, I know, are self-centered, including myself. Because we are self-centered, uh, it is easy for us, us to interpret the message to my own favor, for my own ego to, to, to satisfy, to, to my own like. When that happens, the message is twisted. The meaning is twisted. You cannot have proper good interpretation, but you will have uh, the interpretation that is uh, that is not really uh, the, the, uh, what the original intention is. So because of that, it is easy for us to get out of that original uh, intention and the original meaning and message. So again, the key to the good, successful biblical exegesis is to have objective mind, objective. I mean, laying out all your uh, ego and your own uh, perspective or even the preference when you are doing a Bible uh, interpretation, even the preference, uh, your style may uh, interfere, interfere with your uh, interpretation. So try to lay out those. This, this is a very key to a good interpretation. Then we have false teachers. Uh, when, when we say false teachers, People may think of uh, 
You may think of heresies and occult. Yeah, these are the false teachers. But the problem, real problem is within the church, within the good uh, church, healthy church, pastors and uh, some uh, leaders, they are actually being false teachers without knowing that they are actually doing the false teaching. This happens not because they, they are uh, intended, intending to do so, but they have learned from false teachers. The, the, that is, which is not true to the Bible, but they have learned and they teach them to their uh, young uh, believer. For example, in America, there are still some people, some believers, some, I mean, good fundamental Christians who believe that God has intended race to be the measurement of human ranks. Again. And then they, they find the, their doctrine in the event of Noah after the flood. There are there three sons and Noah was naked because he was drunken. And being naked, you know, that's, that's a shame for many cultures and especially, you know, Middle Eastern culture and in, in Asian culture, we know being naked, uh, whether it's a man or a girl, uh, it's, it's a shame. And then their three sons uh, take a different actions. One son goes in and, uh, you know, he kind of was frustrated and uh, comes out and tell his brothers, oh, this father of mine, our father, he, he is so drunk and, uh, you know, he's being, he's naked, sleeping. What a shame. And then another son goes in and walks backward with the uh, cloth and covers him. See, so each son take a different, you know, attitude. And then as, as uh, Noah finds out and he kind of gives a curse or different uh, prophetic words about uh, their three sons, and they think uh, the, these uh, some some fundamental believers because of that they're a race of white and uh, the, the the yellow and black and black being the one who actually cursed uh, the father or or said the bad words against the father. See, this is the. There nowhere in the Bible says that it's been the reason for the, the, the different color of skins that we have. But someone, someone with a false intention has developed uh, this kind of dogma, uh, the wrong doctrine, evil doctrine, and justified uh, their rule over the black uh, people. See, that's a sad part about, about uh, American history, uh, especially the Christian history. But these, these doctrine, false doctrine has been taught in the church, white churches and even the black churches. And then, then it, it kind of justifies the racial you know, discrimination in this nation. Uh, this very similar things in happened not only in America, it, it had happened in Europe and even in Asian churches. There are these false teachings uh, that has not has to do with uh, racism, but some other things. And another good example is the poor is poor because they are judged by God and poor are poor because they are not diligent 
and that the, these things are taught in a church as 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 something of the doctrinal uh, truth. And uh, when that happens, you know, you you're gonna teach to your young because you're taught, and no one has examined whether that is true or not. And if that happens, the false teachings go hand in hand, generation to generation. And so knowing that the Bible is a very unique book, it is a very special book to interpret. It's not just like us, those, you know, textbook that we read. It's, it's different. So you have to understand, okay, I'm dealing with a very different kind of book, unique book. And now, what is interpretation? What do you do when we say, I'm going to interpret the Bible? I'm going to study the Bible. You know, when you say, I'm going to study the Bible, it means I'm going to make some interpretation of the text that I am going to read. Because many times, Bible does not say the things in a very explicit way but more of implicit way I'll, I'll you know try to explain that term implicit and explicit later on but for now it means interpretation it means you are trying to find out meaning or meaning sometimes it's hidden intentionally hidden meaning but usually the means are clear and and exact. I mean, you don't need to have those guess words. But if you are reading a narrative, for example, you're reading the, the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. If that is the case, Usually, it does not say, this is the lesson of this particular story. Moses, he Moses and his people, the Israel, faces the bitter water. And then they complain. And then Moses go, go ask, uh, pray God, and then he finds a, a, a remedy and resolution. And uh, the, the, the story is uh, simple, but it doesn't say anything about the lesson. So your job as a biblical student, uh, the, the one who does uh, exegesis, you need to find out what's the meaning of the story. And that's, that's the interpretation. So all the passage, I mean, the, the narratives, the stories in the Bible, it does demand the, the interpretation by nature. But some of the messages, for example, you're studying the book of Romans, written by uh, uh, the Paul, the Apostle Paul, or Saint Paul, whatever you prefer. And you read, uh, you know, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. It talks about do not follow the, the, the trends of the world. What, what does it mean to follow the trends of the world? You may think of very hundreds of different things. I mean, uh, you know, I told you, if there's a hundred students sitting here, they'll have all different, you know, uh, understanding of the message. So find out meaning, that's the number one. Uh, and uh, with the meaning, there is a, an intended message. And not only the meaning, the message is, what does God wants me to do? Or what does God wants me to, uh, you know, uh, grant? So the message is God's intention. You don't stop at the finding the meanings.
Buddha reflect. Sometimes meaning equals to message. It's the same thing. But many times meaning is a meaning and then you have to find the message and the real truth the, the intention of God toward the me. So that's the message. So message is the equal for everyone, but it is all at the same time, it is different for the everyone. So again, the message is God's intention, what God intends you to perceive and accept and act out. So many times the message involves your actions, what you need to do after understanding the meaning. So it connects right away to the interpretation means making personal application. So good interpretation at the end, uh, you, you are going to, you know, have certain applications. You need to, I mean, application means within and with the outside. First application happens here in your heart, in your head, in your mind, in your soul and spirit, then in your hands and feet. So that's kind of a, a application and the implication that we are talking about. So implication is change of your heart and application is acting out that change that happened within your heart. Because, because the Bible is a, it's a kind of a literature and uh, there is certain principles and the methods that apply to the interpretation of Bible, I mean, the literature. So this, these, these principles are not only, you know, uh, applied to the Bible, it's a general universal uh, principle for interpreting any, any literature in any language. First, we need to understand the nature of written literature versus, versus the oral speech. Oral speech, when it is said, say, I'm giving this lecture to you. The thing is, People are not going to listen the same thing. If you do research, say I give five minutes of speech on a, on a particular subject, people will have a very different understanding of the oral speech. And then you cannot repeat the, that uh, oral speech. I mean, today, modern days, you can record it and you can go over it and listen it over and over again. But in, in the old days, before we have any kind of uh, uh, voice recording, once it is said, it is said. And you sit there and listen and you perceive them, the, the speech. And it's gone. You cannot repeat it unless you have a good memory. And the, some people in their ancient days did have good memory. When they listen, they can regurgitate or repeat exactly what was heard. But even that has a certain limit. On the other hand, the literature, it is written, it is recorded, but that does not mean it is perfect because when people read their literature, they may highlight certain part to the, the, some other parts. And the, so the perception is different, but yet 
you have coherent and unchanging documentation of what is said or what is meant. So that's the advantage of having the literature. That's why God has given this written Bible. I told you that uh, people did not have a written Bible until some sometime later, right? So God knew that uh, you know we are going to mess up when we only have an oral tradition. So He enabled uh, people to have this, you know, letter alphabet and be able to write in Hebrew and in Greek. So we have a written literature. And again, interpretation takes the science of literature study. I've, I've uh, talked about in the last class, right? So we need to do the good science, not having the prejudice or not having the certain uh, Mm. certain uh, direction but good science then it takes a certain artistic uh, part uh, not only the science this literature interpretation it is an art So it takes a good artistic skills, artistic sense to have a good biblical exegesis. Because uh, art is not a science, I cannot, I cannot, you know, present uh, what is a good art. You know, it depends on each individual. Uh, Now the message. Message, I, as I defined it, as we define it, it is. It is what God has originally intended to the people who are perceiving that particular thing, or through the stories. So first thing is to discern. Uh, this discerning to discern the message. It takes a inspiration another word we need help so without inspiration you may say oh, this is the message but if it does not speak to you we don't say that's the message so message has to speak to you it has to be relevant for you and uh, you have to respond. So when we say the message, it means the part that has spoken to you, even though say uh, there is a given text and it has 10 different messages in it. But the, when we say the message, it could be only three. Would it make sense to you? Or none for the, for the matter. So there's no message for you then. Uh, 
even though you have studied and researched the particular uh, given text without inspiration, the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you understood the, uh, the passage, you understood the text, you know what it means, the meanings, but does not mean the message. The message, when you respond to these, the, the, the message is given, it becomes true message. And there is a message verse medium. These alphabetical letters, whether it's a Greek, Hebrew, whether it's in Chinese, Korean, you know, the letters are letters. They are uh, in the form of text. So those are called the medium. It's, it's, it's carrier. It's like a car. You drive in it and you are the message. Car is just a car. You can use a red car, black car, big uh, van, or just a uh, passenger car. You know, whatever the uh, car, it, it needs to uh, bring you from A to B. That's the function of a car, same thing. The medium does bring the message from A to B. But do not confuse the message with the medium or medium with the message. It is different. So you need to discern the medium to the message. The problem is some of the, the, the Bible, for example, the narrative. As you read the narrative, there are stories that has nothing, I mean, it does ask to do the message. It helps to you to understand the message, but it's not directly related to the message. There are characters who are not believers in the Bible. It does. We have many characters who are not Christian or who are not Jews or who are not faithful. But these characters, they are the message. So. You don't just follow uh, the, the follow it because it is in the Bible. For example, King David. She he he had an eye for Bathsheba. Someone else someone else's wife, Uriah, Uriah's wife. And he he used his his power as a king to take that wife. The, the, the girl that he, he was interested because he liked her. The uh, Bible didn't say he loved her, but he liked her. And he took uh, Bathsheba as his wife, even uh, you know, trying, setting up the, the, her husband to be killed in the battle. So that is in the Bible, because it is in the Bible, it is the message. It's not the message. The message is, do not do this. Do not do this. It's a bad example. So those are also the medium. And the, the message is on the line. So your interpretation has to come up with this is a evil and uh, he himself thought the king David knew that it is evil but he still did and the God had uh, spoken and then took punishment after the uh, this thing happened and so on but God still allows that to happen to the king David who who's known to be very faithful to God. So the question is, how could that happen? Someone as much faithful as King David commit an adultery. 
And, uh, you know, interpretation takes a step to try to understand what is God trying to, to say here. And God allows and sees and does nothing as it happens. He come, he could send these angels and say, that, that is wrong, don't do it, King David. It's gonna ruin your life uh, from here and on. And he did ruin his life because he, he has to pay uh, for the result of that. And uh, uh, the, 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 the later stories say he has suffered from all the consequences. And that also gives you a, a lesson and a message, so on. So try to separate and discern the message from the medium. Now we come to this. There are two different types. Uh, there are more, of course, more. more. But simply, uh, as, as we do the interpretation, these are the important key terms. Uh, implicit and explicit. Uh, if you're a Christian and if you're uh, uh, the Muslim, uh, you are familiar with this Ten Commandments of Moses. We do believe in the same thing, whether you're Christian, Catholic, or uh, Muslim, or Jew, we know you know what the Ten Commandments are. And even for Christian, it is still a valid, a valid commandment for us uh, Christians as well. And it says, do not worship anything other than God Yahweh. And it's very explicit, meaning it's there. You, need, you don't need any interpretation. It is what it is saying. Do not worship other God. Just worship me. It's simple and clear. And there is no, I mean, you can try to explain it. It does take some explanation, but it does not need any interpretation. So these messages are very explicit, clear and open and, uh, you know, no more. But implicit messages. For example, when Jesus said, repent, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay. Repent, it does come with a very many different interpretation. Repentance for a person may be different from the repentance for B person. They, they understand the word differently. So inter what interpretation does is try to define the repentance as Jesus has spoken. And also kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It is not that clear. You have to do some research to uh, define and understand the kingdom of God. And why is Jesus saying kingdom of God is near. I mean, he could say kingdom of God is here, referring to himself, but he didn't say that kingdom of God is near. So all these words in, in that very short sentence, it's even shorter than the first commandment in the 10 commandments. It does require much interpretation when we see those kind of passages as 
say it's implicit, meaning it's kind of hidden. It's under there. And uh, it does require uh, some or more interpretation. So that's implicit message. And these implicit messages are intended. Usually it is intended in the Bible. Because when people do not understand the right away, the good, good uh, student of Bible will develop, develop curiosity and interest. And that, that hunger for the, for the knowledge, the message, hunger for God. And people want to know deep, deeper of God and more of God. That's, uh, that's positive desire. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't say it's natural uh, for any, any uh, believers. But good believer who is inspired by the Holy Spirit will develop very key interest and, you know, curiosity, that hunger for the, for the true knowledge, uh, the, the understanding of the Bible. Thus, getting more closer to God, uh, acquainted with God. So that's that's a that's a natural for the good believer, but it is not natural for a human being. So implicit message is intended, and this this is a you know fun part of our about doing the biblical exegesis. It is my own experience as a, as a as a Christian, not even as a pastor, uh, but as a Christian, I I find the joy, really really great joy in, you know, finding the the the, the this hidden message, or rather difficult passage, and as you study them and you oh. There are those moments saying, wow, okay, this is this is God that I believe. This is the this is the way the Christian should live. There are those moments. And it's uh, the utmost joy of knowing who God is and what uh, the the real intention of God is. That's uh, the joy of studying the Bible. See? So it connects, connects to the discovering the true meaning. Finding out the source or author's original intention. So that's the key. When we say the message, it is, has to do with the original intention. It may, you know, have a, you, you can have a secondary or third, thirdly uh, messages reflecting on the original intention, but that's not the original uh, intention and the message. So uh, before you go to the secondary uh, implication or, or interpretation, but you need to focus on the primary, uh, the intention and the message. Also fully identifying with the original receptors. Uh, it means, there is always original readers or, or, or the listeners of the message. When the uh, prophet, I, prophet Isaiah speaks his message, there were audiences, the Israelites, at the given time and the given place. And they, they perceived uh, Isaiah's message in, in a way that the message was intended to. And our job is not only find the, the original intention of the Isaiah and the, the scar, but try to sit in the in the in, in their shoes, so sort of so sort of speak. So in their shoes and try to listen as the original listener, original uh, reader of the given message and when when you are able to do that and then you cannot make a mistake of 
having the wrong implication or application. So this is very important uh, for any uh, student of biblical exegesis. You try best, your best, to be the original listener and the receptor. Then understanding the exact semantics of the original language. Uh, you cannot, you, you don't, do not speak that uh, Aramaic or the uh, Jewish language, Hebrew, or the Greek. Uh, I, I don't think any, any of you uh, do, and I, I don't. So, it's, it's not even my second language, right? But, there are good resources, the materials, uh, that are available easily. Just, you know, typing out a few words on your smartphone, you'll, you'll find all the best resources already there. Rich, very rich, and the good ones. So, if you get trying to get the familiar with the original language using these uh, resources even though you you do i mean these days you do not need to uh, really become the good scholars of greek or hebrews to understand the uh, bible uh, the biblical original language then the discerning the uh, levels of the message uh that that takes some it takes some uh, experience and uh, it is a kind of skill that you are going to develop as you keep continuing doing biblical exegesis. I've been doing this for like 30 years, then I kind of know by reading it, okay, this is uh, th this level of uh, message and th that is a different level. Uh, so there are certain level of uh, messages or a better word would be some message some messages are heavier than the other some messages are lighter than the other some messages are in the level of truth. Some messages are of intensity of principle, while the sum of the message is uh, 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 in the form of instructions. And some of the messages are in the form of recommendation. When it becomes a recommendation, you can do it or you cannot do it. Even though you cannot do it, it's not disobedience. Uh, or, nor the negligence or the sin. Uh, so recommendation is a recommendation. You, you are free to choose to do it or not. Instructions, it applies to the certain situation, uh, to the certain kind of people, but it does not apply to some other uh, Christians uh, in a different uh, situation and if they are a different kind of people. So. Those are like instructions. Then there are laws. Laws are basically it's a must and it's a, a very mandatory, mandatory for the Jewish people at the given time. But it is not mandatory for us today. For example, most of Christians today, they, they are free to eat at uh, the pork, the the, the uh, pig meat, uh, but in, in the time of Moses and afterward, the Jews did not, you know, even associate with the the, the, the pig. Uh, they are not domestic animals for the Jews. So that's this kind of laws, and, uh, and so laws are the. It is a kind of message. It does have uh, the, 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 is, so it's similar to instructions but a little higher level. 
So there are, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say and hear is there are certain levels of the messages and the intensity. And some message, uh, the messages are mandatory for any believers at any time, who, whether you're Jews, Muslim, or Christian, this is a must. And uh, that's kind of a uh, differentiating of the message. So I think the time's up uh, for, for the day. And uh, we came up to the how we can discover a true meaning through the biblical uh, interpretation or exegesis. And we're going to continue uh, about the understanding of the interpretation. Once we do understand what the interpretation is, uh, then uh, it, it is part of how to do it. Okay, And we'll continue uh, with the uh, the real uh, strategy and the methodology of doing uh, actual exegesis. Thank you again for listening and have a wonderful and beautiful day. God bless.